These are the headquarters of Texas Instruments in Santa Clara, California, in the heart of the Silicon Valley. Inside this building, engineers are working on the next generation of TI Systems software. But many of their colleagues working on the same project are 12,000 miles away in Bangalore, India, all interconnected via satellite. In India, Taiwan, and even China, American computer companies are finding a low-cost alternative to the high cost of domestic software development. Today, part two of our special look at third world software on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Chronicles is made possible in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte magazine, and VIX, the Byte Information Exchange. In print and online, Byte and VIX serve computer professionals worldwide with detailed information on new hardware, software, and technologies. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. Gary Kildall is off this week. What I'm doing here is working with a program called PRISM. It's a comprehensive manufacturing control and management program. It's being used by many companies around the world in different countries. And what's most interesting about this program is it was developed under contract by a company in a third world country in India. In fact, many American computer companies, Texas Instruments, Hewlett Packard, Digital Equipment, Apollo Sun, Microsoft, Citicorp, are either developing software in India or negotiating deals to do so. One of the reasons India has been leading the world in the export of software is probably its extensive educational system, with universities and technical institutes turning out tens of thousands of computer engineers each year. In part two of our special look at third world software in India, we begin by an examination of that educational system. Here in this country of almost 800 million inhabitants, American computer companies have discovered a pool of two and a half million English-speaking programmers and engineers. They are the product of a sophisticated system of higher education. India's major asset is manpower. Not low-cost manufacturing manpower like you'd find in the Far East, but low-cost and more importantly, high-quality engineering manpower. This university in Bombay is just one of several major universities and technical institutes scattered throughout the country that are producing more than 10,000 graduate engineers each year. Advantage is our manpower. We have tremendous potential. We can build very large pool of talented people in this field. I can find you 50 PhDs from US in less than two weeks. Okay. I can find you physicists, mathematicians, chemists, who will also have background in computer science. So not just computer science, a lot of other background. As you know, we have large scientific manpower, not just in computer science. One of India's major technical schools is the Indian Institute of Technology in New Delhi. Many graduates of the IIT choose to continue their studies in the States. I would rate the level of education, at least at the undergraduate level in India, in the Indian Institutes of Technology comparable to any best anywhere available. And I can say that with degree of confidence because our students have been able to find admissions in the best universities in the world including Stanford, MIT, Berkeley and you name it in US itself. The IIT's PC lab is open 24 hours a day and serves graduate and undergraduate students. There is such a demand for the lab that students often line up at the door waiting to get in. The Institute offers courses in design automation, robotics, computer networks, and parallel processing. A school with an altogether different curriculum is the NIIT, or National Institute of Information Technology. NIIT is a private group of training centers offering courses in basic computer literacy, programming, and systems design. The school staff are also available as corporate consultants. NIIT claims to have trained 50,000 students since its founding in 1982, yet in spite of the vast number of Indian programmers graduating each year, NIIT's director shares a common concern about India's brain drain. I think it's a very significant problem. I'm told that out of the 
IITs, which are our top-end technology institutes, almost 75% or more of the students graduating in computer sciences leave every year. That's one. And then even the software export activity, uh, that also is pulling away a lot of our good people because we're doing a lot of contracts where our people are working on contracts in the U.S. So they've been there, they're there for two years or three years or four years. Whether Indian students choose to leave or stay, they graduate from school with another kind of talent, an acquired ability that may be the key to their success in the computer software field. Most of our people are already trained in English. Our languages are also very similar to English languages. They are structured languages. It's not pictorial language like Japanese or Chinese. And when you think in structured language, writing software becomes easier. When you write in pictorial language, writing software becomes difficult. So I would definitely say that Indians are much better software programmers than others. No question about it. Some observers have found parallels between India's booming software business and the offshore hardware industries of other Asian countries like Korea and Taiwan. While English-speaking India may be the world leader in offshore software, competition is starting to appear among its Asian neighbors. I think uh, the, uh, the dragons of the Southeast, like Singapore and Hong Kong and Malaysia, are all uh, uh, potential uh, uh, competitors. But I'm reminded of a recent study which Hewlett Packard Company did, uh, where they sent out a corporate team uh, to visit Asia to source uh, countries, and they ranked India number one. Just coming into sight on the distant horizon are countries such as the Republic of China on Taiwan, better known for cheap hardware than for bargain-priced software. In population and size, the Republic of China on Taiwan could easily fit into one of India's smaller states. But in terms of hardware exports, Taiwan has captured a generous portion of the world PC market. At the Sinshu Science Park, south of Taipei, there are companies making PC clones, add-on boards, disk drives, keyboards, and mice, and almost all of it shipped overseas. The company names are familiar to most PC users, but in spite of the country's comfortable lead in hardware exports, Taiwan's government is pursuing the development of a local software industry as well. There are a couple of reasons. First of all, in the last, I mean, in the past of years, the microcomputer industry has been proving very good, I mean, from Taiwan. And the companies like Acer, MyTax, they really need some software industries to help them to uh, upgrade to the system levels. Uh, for example, if they can provide some desktop publishing systems, information retrieving system based on the microcomputers, then they can compete with not only the Korean um, uh, products from Hong Kong, products from some other, um, you know, some other countries. Taiwan's Institute for Information Industry is promoting several kinds of software development, some of which add new functions to popular hardware products like laser printers and scanners. In application software, the III is focusing on desktop publishing in particular and products for the Microsoft Windows environment. Okay. There are advanced projects as well in artificial intelligence, expert systems, and computer-aided software engineering. I don't think we're going to um, occupy the whole world market, okay? I believe Indian probably are very good for the software industry. Well, so as so as us. I think the most important strength is the manpower, I guess the brain power of the peoples. Paperback Software is one of the few U.S. firms selling software inside India. It just won a massive contract to supply three of its programs with each computer sold into the Indian school system. A contract worth some three million copies of VP Planner, VP Info, and VP Expert the first year alone. Paperback Software also sells its product to end users in India through a distributor. 
And finally, the firm has contracted with Indian programmers to design a VP expert-based expert system, which founder Adam Osborne suggests will revolutionize travel agencies. He says programming in India is one-fifteenth the cost in the U.S. It's, it's a just absolutely a natural way for us to be a developing product. And we anticipate where well, we're going to start with this one, get things worked out, and in the end I foresee paperback software doing all of their major expert system product developments in the future, not the tool itself, that we will do here, we will continue doing here, but the products that use the tool we will be doing in India. Osborne spent much of his childhood in India, so he has a deeper understanding of the country than most. He believes that in a short time, the country will undergo a radical transformation. Salaries in India are going to go up. At the moment, they have an oversupply of programmers and engineers. First, they'll mop that up. Once they've mopped that up, then you're going to see salaries increase, and you're just going to see the same thing happening as, as you've seen in Korea or Taiwan and then Japan. And I would say by the turn of the century, Indian salaries are going to still be lower, but not that much lower. and certainly not going to be a 15th. And sometime in the year 2020, I expect that India is going to be in very much the same position as Japan. You know, they're going to have enormous uh, foreign reserves, but they're not going to have that much price difference anymore. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. India's drive to become a high technology center involves more than improving the country's trade balance. The new liberal trade policy has an ulterior motive, to raise the country's domestic level of technology applications. At first glance, it might seem unlikely that a developing nation like India would benefit from the PC revolution. While the country has made great strides in feeding its vast population, close to 40% of India's people still live in poverty. But India is also a vast industrial power, among the top 10 industrial nations in the world, with its own satellites and space program. Today, there are many examples of how India's homegrown computer industry has improved day-to-day -day life in India. In the past, the trouble with the Indian railway system was not how long it took you to get from A to B, but how long it took you to buy a ticket. It wasn't uncommon in the past to have to wait in line for eight hours or more just to buy one train ticket. Now, thanks to a computerized reservation system, the average wait in line has been cut to less than 20 minutes. The Indian railway system is one of the world's largest and the principal means of transport for the Indian people. Over 10 million passengers board Indian trains each day. Until recently, buying a ticket was a complicated and time-consuming ordeal, requiring half a day or more of waiting in different lines for different trains. The new computerized reservation system, called Impress, was developed by the CMC Corporation of New Delhi. In the railway stations, for example, in a big railway station like New Delhi, uh, actually there are about 160 trains going every day and each train has to have a counter. Now there are certain trains where the rush is very great and in others it's much less. A person going in a train which is very crowded has to stand in a queue which is uh, you know very very unwieldily long and it takes a lot of time, almost a full day to buy a ticket. So now what has happened is from a dedicated counter for a train, it is any counter, any train. And uh, people have really come and told us that uh, it's a real great difference. The Impress reservation system controls hundreds of train movements from Bombay to Calcutta, from Delhi to Madras. The memory capacity exceeds 2,500 megabytes of storage. Booking a seat can be very complex. There are four different classes of service, and within each class, you can book sitting, sleeping, or standing room. There are express and local trains, and there are dozens of discounts for everyone from art students to bravery award winners. The reservation system includes video displays of the status of each train. 
trains are routinely overbooked in India and waiting lists are common. The status screens are color coded. Green indicates that seats are available. Yellow stands for reservation against cancellation, whereas red means wait list only. A blinking cell means the status is about to change. New Delhi station alone sells about 50,000 seats per day. While computerizing India's immense rail network may be a unique challenge, the technology used in the process is applicable to other similar projects. And more importantly, it is exportable. Railways may not be so very relevant in a developed country because uh, other forms of transport are more prominent. But uh, a freight management system, for example, or uh, an online transaction processing system of such a magnitude would be useful in so many other uh, applications, like in ports. There are so many areas, even airline reservations. So we can easily translate these skills to developing relevant applications in whatever country it's needed. Statistically, India is a country of mind-boggling numbers. Almost any kind of large-scale computer project quickly becomes a massive undertaking because of the sheer size and diversity of the country. There are 12 cities in India with over 1 million population, and four of those have populations exceeding 4 million. Yet over 70% of the population lives in rural areas scattered amongst 500,000 villages. In an effort to link the widely dispersed government offices, India's National Informatics Center is building a wide area satellite network. When complete, it will link 32 state governments and 441 local districts with 500 earth stations, possibly the largest network of its kind in the world. NICNET, as it's known, provides a query-based national database accessible to all government entities. NICNET reaches into every corner of India, including remote jungles where, according to reports, technicians were chased away by unfriendly local tribes. The NIC's next project is to create an Asian computer network linking countries from Bangladesh to Iran. According to the new Indian trade laws, foreign companies can establish joint ventures with 40% minority partnership or 100% ownership under certain conditions. Many of the fully owned subsidiaries are located in duty-free export zones like the Santa Cruz Electronics Export Processing Zone or SEEPS near Bombay. Bombay is the New York and the Hollywood of India, combining financial power with Tinseltown glamour. Recently, India's premier business city added high technology to its collection by giving exporters a very special deal. Seeps, a campus-like suburban industrial park, is the first duty-free export zone in India devoted to electronics and software. Companies setting up shop here are entitled to a tax holiday for the first five years of operation, and they receive a 50% discount on the lease. The rent is cheap, about three rupees per square foot per month. That's equal to about 20 cents. Among software exporters, Citicorp is a major tenant at seats. With an office that looks like it could have been airlifted from the Silicon Valley, Citicorp Overseas Software Limited, or COSL, is connected to other Citibank offices by electronic mail. The company has imported a sample of almost every kind of hardware, from IBM mainframes and deck vaxes to PS2s and Macintoshes. COSL was started in 1985 to develop software for Citibank, but they have expanded to produce securities trading, accounting, and retail banking software for worldwide sale. One of the company's recent projects is a PC-based retail banking package called MicroBanker for smaller banks and branch offices. COSL also designed a securities trading system called Straps. It's in use today at the Vienna branch of Citibank. 
Banking software is also popular at Tata Unisys, a joint venture founded in 1977 and 40% owned by the Unisys Corporation. The company is working on a signature verification system that makes it possible to check a customer's signature online at any bank branch. It's an example of what the company calls mission-critical systems. There are some good examples of that in, in banking and so on, where uh, companies like SWIFT, for instance, are using uh, computers for electronic funds transfer, and they created a whole new business using computers. More recently, uh, some of the leading banks uh, see computers as being a critical edge in their competitive weapon in the financial services market. SignBank is a program that digitizes and stores signatures for later verification by a bank teller. The software can present signatures in any graphic form, including Chinese characters and the phonetic equivalents. Tata Unisys also developed a package for foreign exchange dealers called EasyDeal. Designed for smaller networks, the software interface can be controlled either through the keyboard or by touchscreen. The SignBank and EasyDeal projects grew out of customizing work for outside clients. For instance, EasyDeal came up from the work we were doing for the SWIFT electronic funds transfer system where we got interested in foreign exchange and began to understand that market and began to see the opportunities that were coming up. Uh, sign bank similarly has come up from our work in the financial area. So even though uh, there is no advantage uh, relative to doing the same development anywhere else, uh, in this case the advantage is the original creativity of the idea itself. The SEEPS Park and the new liberal trade laws are a well-tested means to attract foreign investment and it has boosted India's business image overseas. But if more American and European companies are adding India to their list, it is clear that some old stereotypes are still prevalent. You'd be surprised how many senior executives in the U.S. that I've met tell me five minutes after I've talked to them that you speak good English. You know, it's, it's a strange thing. I've sort of, in the beginning, I used to get upset about it. Now I've got used to it. In fact, I tell them that we don't live on trees and that, you know, we have, there is a civilization here that exists too. As you know, we have large scientific manpower not just in computer science. So we can put this manpower to use to expedite the software development worldwide. So together we can bring information society faster to reality than US was to do it or Europeans were to do it by themselves because this is going to require millions and millions of man years of software. So that's the potential. Some pundits have said the microcomputer was a revolutionary tool, that it would bring sexual equality to the workplace, encourage the free flow of information in communist countries, and leapfrog national boundaries to create one global electronic community. Well, here in India, a country with many social problems and few natural resources, it has been a kind of revolutionary tool, enabling a relatively small group of enterprising people whose major asset was a logical mind to become major players, if not leaders, in the worldwide software industry. In Bombay, India, for the Computer Chronicles, I'm Stuart Shafay. In the random access file this week, Arch Rivals, Compaq, and IBM have signed a cross-licensing agreement covering patents in the area of personal computers, peripherals, and other advanced computer technologies. Compaq said the patents it would license from IBM would include microchannel-based products, but Compaq said it had no plans to introduce MCA products and was still committed to ESA. The Open Software Foundation has announced that its Motif Unix interface is now available for licensing to software developers. The graphic user interface for Unix runs under the X Windows system and provides a PC-like interface for Unix. Several companies have already committed to Motif, including IBM, HP, DEC, Oracle, and the Santa Cruz operation. Hewlett Packard has cut prices on its Vectra PC models in an effort to stay competitive with Compaq and IBM. The price on the high-end 386 Vectra was cut by $1,300. Lotus has come up with a tighter version of Freelance Plus, the charting and drawing program. The new release of Freelance Plus version 3.01 requires only 438K of memory. Upgrades are available for $20. 
Want to get into the CD-ROM publishing business? Meridian Data of Scotts Valley, California has come up with a complete CD-ROM publishing package for under $5,000. It includes a CD-ROM drive, necessary software and training leading to the production of a disc containing up to 30,000 pages of data. Meridian says it's hoping to convince more companies to start using CD-ROMs. A recent survey showed that 90% of Fortune 500 companies say they are thinking about getting into CD-ROMs, but only 4% are now actually using CD-ROM technology. The American Institute of Small Business has released a new software package called How to Write a Business Plan. Unlike other business plan programs, this one not only prepares the financial data, but also the complete narrative covering such areas as marketing, production, advertising, and so on. How to Write a Business Plan is available in PC or Mac formats and sells for $125. The U.S. Congress has launched a two-year study on the future of computers in this information age. Representative Ed Markey, chairman of the House Subcommittee on Telecommunications, predicted that by the year 2000, 10% of the world's gross national product will be spent on computers and related equipment. He said Japan is already approaching the point where telecommunications products will represent 20% of their GNP. Finally, you're apparently never too young to start using computers. A new service called Computer Tots is selling a specialized computer education program for preschoolers aged 3 to 5. The system teaches the Tots how to use floppy disks, keyboards, mice, and joysticks, and how to use simple math and graphics programs. Contrary to popular belief, the Computer Tots people say working with a computer is not an antisocial activity, but in fact brings kids together as they jointly try to problem solve. That's it for this week's Chronicles. We'll see you next week. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte Magazine, and Bix, the Byte Information Exchange. In print and online, Byte and Bix serve computer professionals worldwide with detailed information on new hardware, software, and technologies. For a transcript of this week's Computer Chronicles, send $4 to PTV Publications, Post Office Box 701, Kent, Ohio, 44240. Please indicate program date. Sima Surakshabal, Oot, Sajile, Chabile, Hilde, Dulde, Sundar, Manmohak, Kaman, Shri Madho Singh Bhati, Deputy Kaman. हमारी सीमाओं के सजग प्रहरी राजस्थान और कच्छ के रेगिस्तानी इलाकों में घुस बैठे तस्करों और अब आतंकवादियों पर नियंत्रण पाने में ऊप दस्ता बहुत ही ऊपर बीएसएफ के अधिकारियों और जवानों अनेक वीरता पुरस्कार दिए